Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Um, I've got to say it's really a challenge to introduce someone who needs no introduction. Uh, so I, I'm absolutely honored and delighted to have a longtime friend and collaborator, Dr. Roxana Marin, joining us from live from New York City. Um, is there anyone in the room who doesn't know Dr. Marin? Okay, well, if you don't, Dr. Maron's been in this business for 20 years. Dr. Maron is one of the uh, founders of TCT. Dr. Maron is, uh, really is uh, my idea of what a scholar in interventional car cardiology ought to be. Uh, and just to make things real simple, uh, virtually every one of us uses one of the several Marin scoring systems for instant restenosis, for example, or for the risk of acute kidney injury, following PCI. These are things that are really important to us. Uh, and I think, uh, if nothing else, we all owe Dr. Marin a sturdy round of thanks for contributing to our field in such a big way. Last night, we had a very spirited discussion on the role of women in interventional cardiology followed by a spirited discussion of the role of women in general cardiology, followed by a spirited discussion of the women, role of women in society in general. So, you know, I can't even begin to tell you the extent of Dr. Marin's knowledge, but it's absolutely wonderful that we have Roxana here with us this morning to, uh, to educate and enlighten us. Roxana, it's all yours. Thank you. I'll wait. Uh, but before that, I have something that's really exciting. Uh, number one, surveys, completion of surveys are important. Number two, video conference and videotaping. We are videotaping, live streaming, and we're on Facebook. Please watch what you say. Uh, also, if you want visibility, sit up front. Uh, the live stream recording uh, of our weekly conferences are always available for viewing on YouTube. And last but not least, uh, Come to our next conference, Cardiology for the Non-Cardiologist, run by Dr. Shah, June 9th. See you there. Roxana, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kleiman, Dr. Reisner, Dr. Shah, Dr. Phillips, all of you, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a, a pleasure for me to be here. I've uh, had a fantastic, enlightening visit so far, and you're all very, very lucky as humid as it is here in Houston. I'm extremely impressed with uh, the incredible uh, camaraderie amongst everyone, and Dr. Zogby is just coming in, and it's wonderful to, to really be here and be a part of this uh, incredible group of, uh, of physicians and clinician scientists, and it's, it's my pleasure to be here, so thank you for the invitation. I didn't know what I should do, so I thought, um, I said, well, maybe we should just talk about women in interventional cardiology, right, guys? That's what you all came here to hear. Um, but then I said, oh, all right, that's um, already old news. We're here, we're conquering, we're already there. So that's not a problem. And we want more women to come in. So for those of you who are in internal medicine or cardiology, interventional cardiology is a beautiful subspecialty don't refrain from it, uh, come to it and follow your passion. But uh, having said that, let's talk about um, the latest evidence on uh, dual antiplatelet therapies and triple therapy, and maybe we're gonna get away from triple therapy after this talk. Um, and it is important for you to note my disclosures as a researcher, I do receive grants to my institution uh, for um, uh, clinical trials from various pharmaceutical and device industry. So when we are talking about um, PCI, there are different clinical settings that we're talking about. In an acute coronary syndrome, this is a ruptured plaque with thrombus, with systemic inflammation, and a heightened platelet, rea platelet reactivity, and a vulnerable patient at large. And when we're talking about a stable coronary disease, that's a whole different plaque phenotype. And for us to kind of put it all together and say everyone should get the same, not one size does not fit all, if there's one thing to learn from this lecture is basically going to be precision medicine and understanding who we're treating, what we're treating, why we're treating them, for how long, 
and with which drug. And, and the cornerstone of our treatment um, modalities are really about the antiplatelet agents. When we perform PCI, we do um, excite the coronary arteries and, and clot formation, and it is important to have antiplatelet regimens on, on board. And there's lots and lots of them, and the question at large is, yes, once I decide and once I discharge a patient home, what should be the duration of this dual antiplatelet therapy, usually aspirin with a P2Y12 antagonist, and for how long should this go on? Is this a forever therapy? just because this patient received a stent. And while many might have thought that a few years back, especially with the first generation DES, times have changed and we need to kind of go through that. And through, through this lecture, for a drug-eluting stent, which is really the only way to go, bare metal stents will be out, are out, pretty much. Um, the duration, I want you to consider these four areas, and we're going to talk about the safety and efficacy, the very important trade-off of bleeding and ischemic complications, the fact that we now have really great devices, new generation DES, and how uh, excellent safety and efficacy profile they have, and then not one size fits all. So let's talk about that. So to begin with, with the safety and efficacy of, of uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapies, there are so many clinical trials even more meta-analyses than clinical trials. Most of them actually, believe it or not, despite the large numbers of patients, most of these are really underpowered because as I said, the current drug-eluting stents have a very excellent safety and efficacy profile. And so you need large numbers of patients to actually say which duration would be best. So not one trial gives you an answer. Maybe the best trial is the DAP DES with 9,961 patients. But even with that, we're studded with issues and I'm gonna go through that. So if you actually kind of go through, there are multiple different durations being tested here. So again, it leaves the physician confused. So let me clear, clarify it for you. So we um, have looked at this, most of this driven from the DAPT study. This is an important study that really changed and everyone thought, well, based on this study, we should be prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies on everyone who receives a stent. And what they did here is they had patients who received the drug-eluting stent come back at 12 months, and the question this trial tried to answer is, is there a benefit to extend dual antiplatelet therapies beyond that 12-month period of time? And with that, they randomized close to 10,000 patients with drug-eluting stents, 12 versus 33 months of dual antiplatelet therapies. And what they showed that, of course, if you prolong dual antiplatelet therapies, you will reduce stent thrombosis significantly. You will reduce major adverse cardiovascular events, mostly driven with myocardial infarction. But what is really funny in this important profile here is that if it's so good to reduce stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction, why is mortality moving in the wrong direction? And this is always the devil is in the details. When you're looking at a clinical trial, you should really take a look at that and, and try to understand that better. Well, the myocard and is the myocardial infarction reduction all from the reduction of stent-related events? Well, in fact, it is not. It is actually non-stent-related thrombotic events were reduced so that new lesions and new events outside of the stent were responsible for some of these myocardial infarctions, 55% of them. And importantly, the price you paid was the very similar increase in bleeding complications. And these are not small bleeding complications. These are gusto, moderate to severe bleeding. It's close to exsanguination. So it is important to kind of think about that in the realm of the real world. And remember, these were patients who were free of events at 12 months, had nothing, at 12 months after a stent, had nothing. They were doing great. And then they were asked, 
to prolong their dual antiplatelet therapies. So we need to, as a clinician, take this into our clinical practice on Monday morning. How do we do this after it was presented as a late-breaking trial and, and, of course, shown in the, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine? So the way to do it is you perform a meta-analysis, and there are many of them, and I'm, with the conflict of interest, I'm showing you mine, the one we did. And this one is we basically combined all of the data, looked at fixed and random effects, and found very, very um, lo logically that if you prolong dual antiplatelet therapies, you will lower the risk of stent thrombosis and the risk of myocardial infarction in all of your patients. And isn't that great? Yes, prolong dual antiplatelet therapies, you will reduce these events. But you will pay a price, and the price is a higher rate of bleeding and probably an increased mortality. Because bleeding matters, and some of these bleeding events are related to mortality, bleeding-related deaths. Because once a patient bleeds, we stop all of their therapies, life-saving therapies, and we will increase their mortality. And there is a very, very important correlation there. So that trade-off needed to be evaluated, and we did the back-of-the-envelope calculation, and it is important for you to note that for every stent thrombosis, that, uh, that you avert with, a prolong with prolonging long, um, dual antiplatelet therapy, you're causing 2.1 extra clinically significant bleeding. So you have to think about these estimates and put this in the context of the patients you're treating because bleeding does matter. In fact, if a patient bleeds outside of the hospital, we have seen a very, very important of correlation of mortality with post-discharge bleeding, and you can compare that with a post-discharge myocardial infarction, the one we're most scared about. We never want to cause, we want to stop myocardial infarction. That's our a dream. But if you are doing that by causing bleeding, the hazard of post-discharge bleeding is five. The hazard of a post-discharge myocardial infarction for a mortality is 1.9. So you can understand that bleeding matters and you have to make good clinical judgment on your patients. And it's important to note that we now have really good new generation DES. And in fact, in our meta-analysis, we were able to tease out with a p-interaction term, which means a statistical significant correlation and relationship with the attenuation of the risk of stent thrombosis with a shorter duration of DAPT in patients who received a second generation DES. And this was confirmed even in the DAPT study when they looked at the Everolimus eluding stent, which was 4,700 of the 9,900 patients enrolled, they reduce stent thrombosis, but look, they're reaching the line of unity. That p-value becomes more vulnerable. The major adverse cardiovascular and, and cerebrovascular events are no longer significant, but what is significant if you prolong DAPT, given a patient with a, with a second generation, the, it just, the math doesn't work and mortality goes in the wrong direction. That is not to say that you should not prolong DAPT in anyone who receives a drug eluding stent of the current generation, but it says you shouldn't um, give it to everyone. And the answer is that one size really doesn't fit all. It doesn't fit all because what we need to do is a comprehensive clinical evaluation, and aren't we lucky as physicians that we get to do that, and that we are still in the driver's seat, that some study isn't going to just put a formula in front of us and say, do it on everyone, and it means that we as clinicians have to think about the bleeding risk, the ischemic risk, and the very important clinical criteria and the clinical evaluation and profile of that patient that we're evaluating. And guess what? A lot of these things, like the socioeconomic status, whether or not a patient is expected to be adherent or have a surgery that they're unexpectedly having to do, is not collected 
in a case report form that can be measured. So these are unmeasured confounders in clinical trials that we, know, we do not know, but a clinician at their seat knows. And at the end of the day, you should be thinking as a clinician, what am I really treating? Am I treating the stent or am I treating the patient? And I hope the answer is the patient and not the stent. And this is really, really a very important question. So who might benefit? If shorter is better, and I can save lives by reducing um, DAPT in the right patient, who should get prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies? Well, there are those patients, and we have a hint from the CHARISMA trial. In the CHARISMA trial, secondary prevention with aspirin plus clopidogrel versus clopidogrel versus aspirin alone was, um, was important um, uh, and showed an, a benefit in these patients for secondary prevention. The primary endpoint of the study was negative, but in those patients who had prior MI, pr uh, uh, PAD, it gave us a hint that the higher the atherosclerotic burden and more risk factors, maybe you should be thinking about giving these patients, looking, mitigating their risk of bleeding, but thinking about these patients receiving uh, a prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies. And a follow-up to that is the Pegasus trial. This is a trial of over 21,000 patients who had stable, who were stable but had a prior myocardial infarction and another risk factor, diabetes, uh, PAD, stroke, et cetera. And these patients with a background of aspirin were given ticagrelor, 90 milligrams, ticagrelor 60 milligrams, or placebo, and followed for 33 months, a long period of time. So a big study, a long period of time. Just think about if you need 22,000 patients to get a p-value, is that p-value really valuable? But there is a reduction. You, can, you do reduce death, myocardial infarction, and stroke in these patients, the reduction, though, is from 9% down to 7.8%. The absolute risk reduction is 1.2% after 36 months of exposure. And the price was a bleeding price that was paid. Increased bleeding, Timmy major and Timmy minor. Timmy minor is not minor. It's only minor if it doesn't happen to you. There's nothing minor about Timmy minor. Timmy minor is pretty significant bleeding. And so is, of course, Timmy major, which is intracranial hemorrhage, drop of hemoglobin over five. I mean, it's a huge bleeding. And these were significantly higher, almost to the same level of the reduction of the cardiovascular death MI and stroke. So what's, what's a clinician to do? Or I would say, what's a girl to do? Because a lot of us are women. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to evaluate the patient's underlying risk and think about their clinical profile. And after a, a, a um, stent placement, we, we publish this in The Lancet, and after the stent pl placement, there's some mandatory dual antiplatelet therapy that they need to undergo probably about six months for stable patients, 12 months for acute coronary syndrome patients. But after that, there has to be a patient assessment. And the patient's assessment has to have to do with the bleeding risk and the ischemic risk and making an important calculation and a good clinical judgment going forward. So how do we do that? Because many of us might need some Risk scores, well, there are risk scores that have been developed. There's the DAPT score, which is a net clinical benefit score that came out of the DAPT study and validated in the PROTECT trial. And what they did is they came up with these integer scores that basically told them if you had a DAPT score greater than two, your number needed to treat to prevent ischemia was only 34, and the number needed to harm to cause bleeding was 272, so this math works. And if you put this into the equation, and when you're evaluating the patient, you can come up with a nice net clinical benefit. The problem of this is that this score is developed out of the DAPT trial, which is a patient who's already made it for a year. 
of dual antiplatelet therapies with no problems. And that's not, it's good, it's a good place to start, but it may not be the full answer for everyone. So we tried to do this in the Paris registry that we ran, and we came up with a score at the time of PCI, especially with both bleeding and thrombosis on the, in one patient getting a risk of bleeding and thrombosis. And what I want you to see, and it's a busy side, and, and you can get to the risk calculator, but what you is very important is that there are overlapping risks. So chronic kidney disease is on both sides. So you're supposed to make those important clinical judgments, and the way you do that is you plot the risk over this um, uh, uh, graph, and it basically, anything above this line is benefit, anything below is harm, depending on where you go with the dual antiplatelet therapies. Another important risk score is the precise DAP score. This is a pretty simple score with um, zero, you know, basically you come up with these, um, with these five elements, a prior bleed, a high white count, an age that's great, uh, uh, you know, you put in the age, and you basically go with the creatinine clearance and the hemoglobin, and you come up with a risk score. And if your risk score is above 25, if you get a, 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 a and you have a high risk score, you should not be prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies on those patients. This came out of a risk prediction for just bleeding, and it is now, it's not the thrombotic risk of the patient. So, all of these risk scores give you some feeling of where, what to do, but they're not, they still do not replace a clinician's judgment. So I would say you could use the risk score to give you a gestalt of where you are, but you as the clinician are still in that driver's seat to make the important assessment for your patient. And another way to do this is by really thinking about a patient-related factor. This is without a risk score, kind of in your brain, Thinking about the patient, is this patient stable or did they present with an acute coronary syndrome? Does the patient have a history of bleeding? Are they at high risk for bleeding? Or do they have diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart failure, prior stent thrombosis, peripheral arterial disease? And here you can make a judgment. You can see already that there is a division of where you would go on the scale of bleeding versus ischemia. The anatomic factors are also very important. If you have a patient with a high burden of atherosclerosis and with a long lesion, small vessel, bifurcation, stenting, complex patient, maybe you go for the prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy. And of course, um, this first generation stents are out of the, out of the question, and, but long stents, multiple stents, those are important also for us to think about. But let's not forget about the patient at high bleeding risk. And a picture is worth a thousand words. We say, who are these patients? We see them every day. I promise you, Dr. Shaw, you will see one of these patients today in the cath lab. That patient is a patient who has a planned surgery. It's the patient who's had a recent stroke, the one who's anemic or has had a prior bleeding, a patient who needs an oral anticoagulant, a patient with malignancy. And of course, the ever, the great work that we have done in advancing the age of our patients with cardiovascular disease, they're living, so they're older. And so these are the patients who are at high bleeding risk. And guess what? They're usually, almost always, excluded from clinical trials. Until most recently, with this new clinical trial that was just published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, where they used the exclusion criteria of other DES trials and used it as their inclusion criteria. And they said, we have a new stent, the BioFreedom drug coated stent, that uses surface modification for putting the drug on the, ab uh, on the, on the abluminal surface of the stent so that it goes into the into the vessel wall, and this Biolimus A9 is an extremely lipophilic, very similar to Sirolimus, and should take care of the restenosis and take care of these patients. And because there's no polymer, maybe we can get away with a shorter duration of DAPT, especially in these patients 
who have never been studied before. So they designed the leaders free trial. They randomized 2,500 patients at high bleeding risk in centers all over Europe to the biofreedom and the BMS, because that's what we were doing. We were giving these patients bare metal stents. We were scared to give them drug eluting stents because you couldn't expose them to prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies even beyond the month. Everyone received one month of dual antiplatelet therapies and they said, let's see how these two do. If we're giving bare stents, can this be as good? They were set up just to be as good as bare metal stents. Well, guess what they found? First of all, Target lesion revascularization significantly reduced because there was an anti restenosis effect of this stent. But very importantly, so was death, myocardial infarction, and stent thrombosis. This really put the nail in the coffin of bare metal stents for anyone. You really should not even be thinking about that anymore. And here you have a significant reduction of these important events in these high, high risk patients. These are patients who had like 13% rate of death MI and stent thrombosis. This is a very high risk group of patients. And in follow-up, we now have new stents, the Synergy stent, which has a bioresorbable polymer with a varolimus solution that is now being studied and has been completed, it's, com it's completed um, the, uh, the enrollment and we'll look at 2,000 patients in 110 global sites looking at a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapies with this new generation DES in those high bleeding risk patients who are usually excluded from clinical trials. And so the Evolve Short DAPT study is moving forward and we'll see the results. And I'm proud to be a part of the, as the global principal investigator for the Zion's Short DAPT um, studies, which is going to look at three months or one month of DAPT in, in these high bleeding risk patients, because we really do, do need to know the answers. Are these next generation DES good enough to even shorten the duration of DAPT down to a month or three months? So what about the bioresorbable scaffolds? They're no longer available, so you need not worry. But some of your patients might have received this uh, bioresorbable scaffold. And from what we know, the optimal duration was supposed to be 12 months, but what we know today is that these stents, as they degrade, and it could take up to three years for their degradation, are associated with a higher risk of stent thrombosis. So while I'm a proponent of a shorter duration of DAPT, if my patient has had a bioresorbable scaffold and they're doing well, on dual antiplatelet therapies, I continue them on because I don't think we know what that duration should be. And what did the guidelines say? Well, they used a report. You, I was on the, on the guidelines committee, but it basically, a lot of this came from an evidence review committee headed by John Biddle, and they reported to us that what we needed to do, that a prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with reducing uh, ischemic events, but increasing bleeding events, and there needed to be a risk benefit issue. And as such, we set up this uh, algorithm for patients who are, it's very simple for acute coronary syndrome patients, everyone gets 12 months, class one, green is class one. And in here, for ischemic heart disease, for if you received a drug eluting stent, it's six months but you still have an out for a high bleeding risk patient to reduce that to three months. And uh, for bare metal stent is just one month. What's very interesting, despite all of the data and all of the evidence that came forth from the DAPT study, the Pegasus study, et cetera, et cetera, even after the 12 month or the mandatory period in the ischemic heart disease patients, the prolongation of dual antiplatelet therapies beyond that only gets a 2B recommendation, which means you really have to put in the bleeding risk in there to make your important judgment. And the uh, 2017 ESC DAPT guidelines are in line. In fact, what they did, very different than ours, they're always a little bit smarter, a little bit faster. They come forth with very nice, uh, beautiful 
uh, uh, schematics, but they put in here for high bleeding risk, you basically, after you perform your PCI, you look at the bleeding risk. And if the calculation of the bleeding risk based on precise DAP is more than 25, it's a 2A recommendation to reduce the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies down to three months. So again, very, very important judgment on the part of the clinician to think about the bleeding risk. And what we're doing today is saying, how could I give great therapies to my patients without exposing them to the risk of bleeding. What we have done in the past, we do this in heart failure, we do it a lot in our subspecialty, we stack therapies. We have aspirin, let's add clopidogrel, and now let's add rivaroxaban on top of that. What the TWILIGHT study is doing, which is a study, an investigator-initiated study, um, I'm the principal investigator of this trial, we decided to go to all of our sites, global sites around the world, to say, when you perform PCI in a high-risk patient population, when you put in multiple stent, stents in diabetic patients in whom you feel that they should go home on a potent agent, well, you give them three months of the dual antiplatelet therapy with your potent agent, Ticagrelor, but then at three months, we will randomize these patients to receive a continued therapy of ticagrelor plus aspirin versus ticagrelor plus placebo. So in a double-blind, placebo-controlled fashion, we enrolled 9,000 patients. It's complete, I'm proud to tell you, as of April 15th, uh, 9,000 patients. And we randomized 7,119 7, patients to receive as, uh, ticagrelor plus placebo versus ticagrelor plus aspirin. So in a year from now, I'll be happy to report those results, hopefully. But before that, at the European Society of Cardiology, we're going to see the results of the Global Leaders trial. That same stent that we talked about, the bio, uh, the bi Biolimus A9 drug-coated stent, is now being evaluated in 16,000 patients where the experimental treatment arm is aspirin plus ticagrelor, but only aspirin for a month. And dropping the aspirin and going to ticagrelor alone strategy. And here, the reference treatment is what we're usually doing, giving aspirin for as long as they can take it indefinitely, ticagrelor versus clopid clopidogrel, depending on the presentation of the patient. The results of this trial will be presented at the European Society of Cardiology. So to conclude on this end is to tell you that after drug-eluting stents, a longer dual antiplatelet therapy is associated with um, less ischemic events, but we have more bleeding events and perhaps higher all-cause mortality. So let's think about that. Spontaneous bleeding events are important. We need to look for bleeding avoidance strategies. And new generation stents have really helped us in reducing stent-related complications. So we can reduce those ischemic complications. But it is important to think about protection against non-stented areas of a patient and their um, other events with prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies in certain patients at high risk for ischemic events. So the biggest question is, can we withdraw aspirin in this patient population, reduce those GI bleedings, because aspirin is a great GI, bleed, uh, GI sluffer, I would call it, and a poor antiplatelet, actually. And so when you have ticagrelor around, it's kind of like the big boss taking care of all the platelets. Why do you need aspirin? And so that was the reason to do those studies, and I think we're going to hear about that. Just quickly, going to triple therapy on oral anticoagulants. All of us are seeing the dilemma, the plot thickens in these patients who come in with oral anticoagulants because now we have a new event, the one where I'm very, very scared of, a stroke, an ischemic stroke that oral anticoagulants do much better than dual antiplatelet therapy. And when we place a stent in those patients who are at risk for those, those AFib patients who require oral anticoagulants, we need to give them dual antiplatelet therapies because they're better than an oral anticoagulant for protection against stent thrombosis. But when you combine those, you basically get 
a very, very high, high bleeding risk. And I'll show you what that is. Take a look at these patients in whom there was aspirin, clopidogrel, and warfarin. And when you go to triple therapy, you're basically quadrupling the rate of bleeding complications. These are huge bleeding complications, TEMI major bleeding. So our Dutch investigators took the first step and said, let's drop aspirin. Why are we giving them aspirin? So what did they do? 573 patients, and they were basically said, oh, you know, this is just such a small study. But yes, they did a randomization, and they were brave to say, we're going to stop aspirin in these patients. We're going to send them home on dual therapy with clopidogrel and, and Coumadin versus the triple therapy, and we're going to examine them a year from then. And guess what? Just dropping the aspirin dropped bleeding by 64% just dropping the aspirin. So that's a huge, huge impact. And guess what? Did they increase ischemic complications because they dropped aspirin? Oh, no, they did not. They, in fact, reduced them. And, okay, we can't look at this. This 40% reduction is probably an over-exaggeration. It's only 573 patients. But I can tell you one thing I know. There's not a signal of harm. So you've got to think about that. Well, the novel oral anticoagulants, the direct oral anticoagulants, are here. So this factor 10A inhibitor rivaroxaban was evaluated in the Pioneer AF study in 2,100 patients undergoing PCI. And we used two different doses of rivaroxaban therapy, one which was a WUST-like arm, 15 milligrams of Xeralto with clopidogrel, no aspirin, for the entire duration versus an atlas uh, uh, re, uh, dosing of 2.5 milligrams POBID with clopidogrel and aspirin. So this gives you triple therapy, but with a lower dose of Xeralto and then a combination with aspirin and clopidogrel versus the standard of care. So uh, we, uh, we actually uh, published this in the New England Journal. Uh, Mike Gibson ran this trial. And obviously, as I said, 2100, so just to keep you, it's a little bit confusing of this trial, but it's a WUST-like, an ATLAS-like, and a triple therapy arm. And guess what we did? We looked at the bleeding complications for vitamin K antagonists plus a dual antiplatelet therapy, 27% of clinical significant bleeding over one year in these patients. This is huge. We were able to reduce that with rivaroxaban plus DAPT by 40%, by 41% with just with dropping the aspirin into the WUST-like arm. So together, all you needed to treat was about 10 or 11 patients to avoid a clinical significant bleeding. We also reduced hospitalization uh, for bleeding and death and hospitalization, and we published that also at the same time. Well, this is not alone because Pradaxa or uh, dabigatran in two different doses was also evaluated against warfarin, and they also showed similar finding of reducing bleeding complications against triple therapy. So once again, another trial that shows that important benefit with no increase in ischemic complications. There are two other trials with the next uh, DOAX, the apixaban trial. Uh, is the Augustus study. This trial is a two-by-two two factorial design and a aspirin placebo double-blind randomization. So I think this is the best design study, largest in size, 4,600 patients. We just finished randomization of this trial. I'm, I'm proud to be on the executive committee of this trial as well, and we'll show the data hopefully at ACC next year. We should see what this does as well as Entrust AF, which is looking at adoxaban 60 milligrams without aspirin with a P2Y12 inhibitor versus a vitamin K antagonist with a P2Y12 inhibitor with or without aspirin. So lots of trials coming. So what, do, what are we supposed to do? What can we know? What's the right choice today? I think we still are looking for more trials, but when you have an AFib patient with PCI, please consider that 27% 27 risk of clinical significant bleeding in the year to come. And think about 
stool therapy in these patients. We're going to learn more and more. Of course, you could or shorten the duration of triple therapy as much as you can because stent thrombosis is minimal, really, in these patients, especially with these newer agents. And oral anticoagulants also have some antiplatelet uh, effects. And stopping one antiplatelet therapy as soon as possible, as soon as possible, um, which is aspirin, I would say, at the even at the time of discharge and maintaining dual therapy might be the best way to go. And in fact, the North American consensus uh, by Dominic Angelulo tells you what to do with these patients. I'm going to refer you, this is a busy slide, refer you to think about how to treat these patients with AFib undergoing PCI, where you think about the pre-procedural considerations in the procedure, avoiding bleeding, bleeding by looking at important vascular access and stent selection. And then very important is the post-procedural considerations in kind of dropping down to a dual therapy. And in fact, one of the things that you could do very, very nicely is this balancing the thrombotic and the bleeding risk. And using this as sort of your barometer, you can DC one of the antiplatelet regimens whenever you want, depending on that patient's risk of bleeding versus ischemic complications. And finally, the um, current guidelines have absolutely no words to say about this because they're waiting to see more and more clinical trials. But very important that if you have a patient with a chads vasc 2 class 1 recommendation is keeping them on an oral anticoagulant therapy. That is not the one you should be dropping. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, Roxana, that, uh, as expected, was fabulous. So I hope no one here is surprised. Um, I have a trillion difficult questions I could ask you. Um, so the bottom line is this. Uh, you've told us you know, we're too mature to be asking for single treatment option solutions. We, we don't do that in anything else in medicine particularly when you talk to an interventional crowd and, you know, the question of managing coronary artery disease comes up, there are always lots of things you put into the equation. Same for antithrombotic medications. Uh, let me ask you this, though. The, uh, the last set of guidelines said uh, very insightfully uh, in patients at high risk for thrombosis and low risk for bleeding, or at low risk for thrombosis and high risk for bleeding, the answer is really obvious. Uh, if you go back to the Paris trial that you did, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, only 7% of patients meet either of those two criteria. So the answer is obvious in one out of 14 patients. Bottom line is, what do you do in the other 86%? Yeah, so I mean I think this is this is the dilemma that we all have and I think that you really what I try to do is to show you some of those um schematics and algorithms that we use in our brain. I mean, it's a brain calculation and it's that seeing the patient, knowing the patient and knowing what they what their anatomy is, what's their clinical profile, have they had a history of bleeding, and really doing that precision medicine on that individual patient because clinical trials give you average results, and no patients are average. We are not a mean or a standard deviation of one thing versus another. We're each individual patients. And so for every patient, you take these data and you put it in your calculus and think about the patient in, in that particular setting for that particular risk profile, depending on their anatomy, clinical profile, and their history, and make a calculated good decision for that patient. You may be wrong. You may be wrong. Uh -oh. but, but at the very least, you've done your very best, which is all that we're supposed to be doing. So I think that's, that's really kind of the, the gist of this lecture, is that not one size fits all.
and that not one trial is ever going to answer the questions for all of your patients, but they just give you a guidance of what you should be doing and how you should be evaluating your patients. So I hope you continue to read the literature, use the risk scores, but still use your own clinical judgment because no one knows the patient as well as you. I can tell you that the pioneer investigators didn't know all of the patients in depth to come up with those results, and I think that's what we need to do. There you, there you go. Roxana, great to have you, and thank you for thank a you, most comprehensive, um, and at times challenging, because, I mean, you, you threw at us so much, so much data and so many trials that not only the cardiologists, but the patients are confused, but also the internet could be confused. Right? So, uh, got it, got it again. So it is a bit confusing. So the question to you is, Beyond a year, I, don't, I mean, beyond a year or even two years at this point, it's not the stent that is in question, it's the patient. Yeah. So the question after a year when, when you know, and the fertilization of the stent most likely is, is, is complete or near complete, it's the role of anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs in a patient with some ischemic burden, and you're thinking about the total atherosclerotic burden for the heart as well as mm -hmm. conceivably stroke, et cetera. So, I mean, to, to me, is no longer the issue of the stent that was placed. Good. <laughs> but how, <laughs> how, do you, how do you navigate somebody with comorbidities and other things that is challenging? And the question is, how can we help? The internist, because many of these patients are seen by internists, and the cardiologist in general, how do you navigate it? Are there nowadays some apps that could make things a little easier for people to look at the risk of not only the thrombotic event or, or atherosclerotic event uh, versus bleeding event? How do you navigate this? And it is a bit complicated. So that's one approach to you. And the other is in the newer that you addressed and the newer stents Okay, and conceivably even shorter and shorter need for uh, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy. Is it because of better endothelialization? Uh, is, uh, is it because of the stent itself or the coating of the stent that is maybe leading to better endothelialization? What's your... So let me answer that one quickly because I think it's really important to understand what's What's new about the new generation DES? The struts are much thinner, so there's thinner strut, and that's that's always been very very helpful in reducing inflammation and reducing clot formation and and thrombotic events. The Polymer, uh, you know, for the Synergy stent, for example, is a bioresorbable polymer. So after a while, the polymer goes away. So it's not durable. The floral polymer seems to be extremely safe uh, on the Zion stent. I mean, they have we have great results, and uh, the drugs are basically the same. It's it's a Limus type of a drug that works extremely well. So in that way, I think we can reduce the, the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies. And I think what's very, very important about that is that many of our patients are going in the real world, as you said, being followed by internists, they go to the dentist, they have to have a colonoscopy, et cetera. So it's good to know that after about three months, of a mandated three to six months of a mandated dual antiplatelet therapy after a fresh stent, you're probably safe to interrupt the therapy if they need to go through a surgical procedure. And I think that was a very important thing to know. But what is much more important is what do you do um, in that patient who, who has a high thrombotic risk? So to your first question, the high thrombotic risk, and the stent is now endothelialized, but now I'm worried about my patient. I want to make sure I prevent events. And I didn't show you the COMPASS study, which showed with a 2.5 milligrams, a low dose of rivaroxaban plus aspirin in those patients at high atherosclerotic burden, you reduce mortality and stroke tremendously. Uh, and amputations by 70% in those patients with PAD. So, but you increase bleeding. So 
what are you supposed to do? I think you have to make good clinical judgment and keep that patient, the, a lot of those patients, on these dual antiplatelets, but survey them very, very quickly. Because it's that same patient who could walk out and and the first bleeding complication for that patient could be a really, really bad one. And then very important is for us to be educated that once a patient bleeds, we shouldn't be scared to take care of them anymore. We should be able to re find out the source of bleeding, take care of that, and then reintroduce the statins, beta blockers, and because bleeding patients, when, we t when a patient bleeds, why do we stop statins? But we do. We don't give them statins. It's like they no longer, don't come near me, you blood. And so we don't take care of them. We don't give them beta, but we don't take care of their hypertension. We don't take care of their statin, uh, you know, their cholesterol. And now we have alternative therapies to, to actually address with PCSK9 inhibitors. We don't have to keep stacking antiplatelet regimens, but if you have a high bleeding risk patient in whom you're worried about their thrombotic risk, you can think about a PCSK9 inhibitor and really pushing the statin and that LDL into the teens. And those are the kinds of things that we as clinicians have to continue to educate our colleagues in internal medicine, in GI, et cetera. But maybe we don't want to educate them too much because we don't want to lose our patients, right? So we keep having them coming back. But it is really important to, to, to continue. Just to follow up uh, is... Since you have some mandate almost for, to about a year, does looking at that one year complications of any bleeding, even minor, predict the following year yeah. or the third it year? Does. Because that conceivably could could modulate what you what It your absolutely does. Be. When a patient bleeds during the time they're given a dual antiplatelet therapy, that predicts their risk of bleeding down the line. Any history of bleeding predicts that you will bleed again. But again, we have to work hard to find those sources of bleeding. And if you look at like, let's say, some of these trials where they gave the potent agents, uh, especially with Prasagrol, they found malignancies. And they thought, oh, is there a relationship to malignancy and Prasagrol? But what it was, it was unmasking uh, a GI tumor or something that was there and actually was preventing cancer-related deaths by unmasking these, these important uh, uh, early cancers in the GI tract. So yes, excellent questions. I have a couple of quick questions, uh, but first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for your visit with us and such a masterful presentation. In one hour, I've learned about two very complex topics more than I've learned at TCTs and ACC. So, Thank you so much. It's a little bit connected to what Dr. Zabi was asking because um, the, do, you, do you think at this point stent designs matter in the second generation DAs? Because the device industry is so gung-go about differentiating polymer versus non-polymer versus biodegradable polymer. Do you think it's a wash? Do you, do you think we should prefer one or the other? And if you're going to be advising device industries and the scientists, what sort of future stent design they should create? Which path would you suggest? So that's my number one question. The second question is, I know you've been um, on the guidelines committee and have been uh, instrumental in writing what we know about DAP from 2016. Europeans allowed themselves to go to one month um, in high bleeding risk. We kind of stopped at three months in high bleeding risk. Our colleagues and even ourselves, we keep on asking, is one month okay? Is three months too much? Or is that just the right mix? Where do we stop? In other words, are they being too cowboyish or are we, are we being too careful? Is there mortality and reduction of MI indicators in a one month HBR patients, almost contrary to those long duration patients, which makes those calls? So two really, really excellent questions. So um, at the risk of being controversial, I will say that um, I would love to have, say that these second generation stents, when they're becoming like less polymer, no polymer, all this stuff is actually making a difference. We just don't know. Could they all be in the same class? They're all having really excellent results. Uh, and do we, are, 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 are our industry colleagues trying to differentiate that to, to drive a market uh, business for themselves? But, but having said that, 
What we haven't seen is a head-to-head -head comparison of, of, let's say, Zions versus Synergy. We haven't seen that. That's not happened. And so I can't answer the question. There could be a differentiating factor, but one does not know because, as you know, the Evolve Short Depth study is a single-arm study. Uh, they, did, they did in senior uh, trial, I couldn't show you all of the trials, but in senior, they did look at synergy versus a bare stent, and they did show a, a much, much better with a one-month of DAPT in old patients that it worked extremely well. So why the Europeans are more, are they more cowboyish? No, their regulators are more, are more understanding to go down to a month. Uh, when we presented the Zions short DAP trial to the FDA, they were very reticent to give us a one-month duration. So Zions 28, which is 28 days of DAP in the high, high bleeding risk patients, are in Europe, not in the United States. So until we get that, those data and that evidence, then we can come in here. Leaders free did their randomized trial. They were able to do that here in the United States down to uh, a month. So we're going to get all of those data coming forward uh, in, in the future. I hope I answered your question. I didn't have really great answers. What, what I'm hearing so far is, is uh, our side of the equation. What should we do with the patient? Uh, as obvious as it uh, appears to be, if we have a literate patient, why don't we present this to the patient and ask them what they want us to do? Well, I love that. You took the words right out of my mouth. We just presented a trial at, um, at uh, Sky. Uh, it was a registry where we use an, a smartphone technology app that we asked the physician, um, these patients with AFib undergoing PCI, we asked the physician, why did you choose the regimen you chose? And they said, well, you know, they did this sliding scale quick answer Right after the procedure, they felt like, oh, I chose this because I'm worried about bleeding or I'm worried about stroke, et cetera. We had the empiric risk of the patient based on their, uh, you know, Chad's VASC and Hasbled score. So we calculated that. And then we went to the patient and we said, what matters to you? And guess what? First of all, physicians are terrible in <laughs> evaluating the, the empiric risk of a patient. So in other words, the empiric chads vask score, when it was very low, the physicians overestimated. When it was very high, the physicians underestimated the risk. So we're not that good in, in our gestalt. Or maybe we are good, and the empiric risk calculators aren't great. We're going to find out when we get the real events in these patients. But you know what? The patients, when they're having a PCI, it's so psychological that at the time of PCI, they don't care about bleeding. They care about stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, and stroke, and they don't care. Okay, so if I bleed, I bleed. I'll have to deal with it. Five months down the line, when the patient is free of the stroke and the stent thrombosis, but every day that they shave, they're bleeding, the first question you ask them, and they'll say, oh, bleeding. Please do something to stop this bleeding. So it's very, very difficult. And going forward, the future is about patient reported outcomes and what patients care about rather than what we as scientists or clinician scientists care about. The hard outcomes are important. Death is important. We want to reduce mortality, but no one wants to be a disabled, alive person. So of course, stroke is going to take a much higher, much higher uh, preference and in hierarchy than mortality. So it's a very, very important question for future. So you're futuristic and thinking ahead. That is how it's going to happen in the future. Uh, Roxana, you are a wonderful combination of a terrific interventional cardiologist and a scholar, and you've become a major thought leader in, oh, in this wise. field. But I must say, you're your presentation, as masterful as it was, I am no less confused yeah. <laughs> now than I was when well, I got here. It uh, is, it's what, not, it is no clear answer. <laughs> That's the problem. It keeps what, the clinician in the driver's seat. I love your comment that it boils down to clinical judgment. Right. Uh, well, just one question. One of the things that we see probably very commonly is patient who's on a, after a stand on dual antiplatelet, uh, 
still within a reasonable time that isn't particularly short, not excessively, but has to have some operation or procedure that's unavoidable. Now, the thrombotic events after stopping and dual antiplatelet are usually not immediate. They're weeks later, months later. Is there a big risk, even early after stenting, to stopping temporarily for that procedure and then restarting right after? So this is a very, very good question. And one of the things we wanted to do is to talk about these patients with planned and study them with planned surgical surgical procedures, but m nobody wants to fund a study like that, so we have to probably go to the NIH. But your answer, your question is a very, very important and prudent one because we're facing those all the time. We tried to look at that in the Paris Registry. We looked at interruption any time during the follow-up period. As long as it was within 14 days that you restarted the dual antiplatelet therapies, allow them to have whatever it was that they needed to do for the interrupted ther time, there was no significant uh, correlation with worsening events in the large scale. Now, it, you could miss, you know, you could be wrong. It's statistics, right? You could, the probability is, is in your favor, especially with new generation DES. You could interrupt therapy after a mandatory period of DAPT. And that mandatory period for a high bleeding risk patient or for a patient who requires it's at least about a one to three months. But if you, let's say, have a patient has a fresh stent, two weeks after the stent, the old lady falls and has a hip fracture and now needs to go to surgery, that patient is your, your our job is to say to the family and to the patient, your risk for clotting the stent or having an ischemic complication of myocardial infarction is high. What we, will, we could do is to use, we will stop one of the treatments, like clopidogrel or aspirin, one of them, and let you go through and you find a surgeon who will operate with, if they don't operate, they will operate on those therapies. And you could bridge that particular patient with a fresh stent with the current uh, Kangralore that we currently have, where you basically give it to them, right, or, or stop it right after the, or stop it at the time of surgery or restart if there's a bridge, you know, if you want to, if you're very, very concerned. But having said that, these patients are at high risk and we have to do everything we can to find a surgeon who will do the operation on some antiplatelet regimen. What you said, though, is the most important. I'm not so much worried about intraoperative complications as I am in the postoperative period of these patients, a month after their surgery, when they are inflamed from their surgery. There's higher inflammation, higher thrombotic risk. And it's really at that time that I would say start the dual antiplatelet therapies very early after surgery, work with the surgeon to really restart that. Are there clear answers to that? No, because no one's ever done a study. How do you randomize patients to fracturing their hip versus not or needing a, a, <laughs> needing a, a, a urgent surgery versus not? It's difficult. But I think it's a very, very you know, good way of thinking about that. There are no clear answers. I'm sorry, I'm confusing you, but there aren't. So the hour is late, but I just, you see that uh, Roxana has uh, appointments not only in medicine, but also in population health sciences and policy, so I want to make a policy comment. And that's that, uh, you know, we're uh, really concerned about physician burnout and resiliency, and you know, we have a committee here called PERT2, which is Physician and Provider Engagement and Resiliency Task Force. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is really important and that, uh, you know, is exemplified by Roxana is that one of the great things about being in medicine, and I think particularly academic medicine, is the long-term relationships that you can develop and the joy that you can see by people's career. So I took Roxana as a fellow when I was the uh, fellowship director at Mount Sinai, uh, saw a spark in her and an intelligence that um, was uh, evident then. And uh, you know the joy to see how uh, her career has so blossomed and what a world leader she is is just one of the things that keeps you going in medicine. So I'd encourage you you know, to uh, find 
well, it's hard to find people like Roxana. <laughs> pick well, pick your fellows well. But also that, you know, these types of things are just, it's one of the great things about medicine. You don't get this in business. You also chose you know? my husband. You actually yes. chose my husband. I know. <laughs> Thank you for that. I know. <laughs> well, Roxana, That's a much more important right, choice we'll that you that. made for me. <laughs> <laughs> by bringing him into the fellowship program. Thank you so much.